Slavery in Ethiopia existed for centuries. The practice formed an integral part of Ethiopian society, from its earliest days through to the 20th century. Slaves were traditionally drawn from the Nilotic groups inhabiting Ethiopia's southern hinterland as well as Omotic groups. War captives were another source of slaves, though the perception, treatment and duties of these prisoners was markedly different. Slaves were also sold abroad as part of the Arab slave trade, serving as concubines, bodyguards, servants and treasurers. Slavery in Ethiopia was first abolished during the Italian occupation period with the issue of two laws in October 1935 and April 1936. The Italian government used the abolition of slavery as a moral justification to its population and the international community for the forced annexation of Ethiopia to its colonial empire. After the end of the Second World War, following the restoration of the Ethiopian monarchy and in response to pressure by Western allies of World War II, Ethiopia officially abolished slavery and involuntary servitude on 26 August 1942. <inaudible> <inaudible> Overview Slavery was fundamental to the social, political and economic order of medieval Ethiopia. Racism in the territory was traditionally mainly directed at ethnic minorities, as well as other individuals from the south of the country. Collectively, these groups are locally known as baria, derogatory terms originally denoting slave descent, irrespective of the individual's family history. According to Henry Salt, the Abyssinian highlanders also actively hunted the Shankela during the 19th century. Following the abolition of the slave trade in the 1940s, the freed Shankela and Baria were typically employed as unskilled labor. Traditionally, racism against perceived Baria transcended class and remained in effect regardless of social position or parentage. Although other populations in Ethiopia also faced varying degrees of discrimination, little of that adversity was by contrast on account of racial differences. It was instead more typically rooted in disparities in class and competition for economic status. The Oromo and Grage were thus, for example, not considered by the Highlander groups as being racially baria, owing to their similar physical features. History Topic background In Ethiopia, slavery was legal and widespread, slave raiding was endemic in some areas, and slave trading was a fact of life. The largest slavery-driven polity in the Horn of Africa before the 19th century was the Ethiopian Empire. Though its intercontinental slave trade was substantial, the Ethiopian highlands were the largest consumer of slaves in the region, before the imperial expansion to the south of Sandabo, Saka, Hermata and Bonga were the primary slave markets for the kingdom of Guduru, Limu Anaria, Jima and Kaffa. The merchant villages adjacent to these major markets of southwestern Ethiopia were invariably full of slaves, which the upper classes exchanged for the imported goods they coveted. The slaves were walked to the large distribution markets like Basso in Gojam, Aliyu Amba and Abdul Rezal in Shiwa. The primary source of slaves for the southern territories was the continuous wars and raids between various clans and tribes which has been going on for thousands of years, and it usually follows with large-scale slavery that was very common during the battles of that era. Slaves were often provided by Oromo and Sadamo rulers who raided their neighbors or who enslaved their own people for even minor crimes. According to Donald Levine, it was common to see Baranas making slaves of Konso, Oromos being sold by other Oromo-speaking clans and Afars making slaves of Amhara. Famine was another source of slaves, and during times of recurrent drought and widespread cattle disease, slave markets throughout the country will be flooded with victims of famine. For instance, the Great Famine of 1890-91 forced many people from the Christian north as well as southern Ethiopia to even sell their children and, at times, themselves to Muslim merchants. Since religious law did not permit Christians to participate in the trade, Muslims dominated the slave trade, often going farther and farther afield to find supplies. In 1880, Manelik II, the Amhara ruler of the Ethiopian province of Shoa, began to overrun Oromia. This was largely in retaliation for the 16th century Oromo expansion as well as the Zamin Mesafint era of the princes, a period during which a succession of Oromo feudal rulers dominated the Highlanders. Chief among these was the Yeju dynasty, which included Alagas of Yeju and his brother Ali I of Yeju. Ali I founded the town of Debre Tabor, which became the dynasty's capital. 
The Oromo expansion of 16th century absorbed many indigenous people of the kingdoms which were part of the Abyssinian Empire. Some historically recorded peoples and kingdoms includes Kingdom of Damat, Kingdom of Enaria, Sultanate of Shoa, Sultanate of Baal, Grage, Gafat, Gans Province, Maya, Hadiya Sultanate, Fadigar, Sultanate of Dawaro, Wurji, Gidim, Adal Sultanate, Sultanate of Ifat and other people of Abyssinian Empire were made Gabaros serfs while the native ancient names of the territories were replaced by the name of the Oromo clans who conquered it. The Oromos adopted the Gabaros in mass, adopting them to the Como clan in a process known as Mogasa and Gudafasha. Through collective adoption, the affiliated groups were given new genealogies and started counting their putative ancestors in the same way as their adoptive kinsmen, and as a Gabaro they are required to pay their tributes and provide service for their conquerors. In southern Ethiopia, the Jibe and Kaffa kings exercised their right to enslave and sell the children of parents too impoverished to pay their taxes. Guma is one of the Jibe states that adjoins Enaria where Abba Bogabo rules and under his rule inhabitants of Guma were more than those of any other country doomed to slavery. Before Abba Rabu's adoption of Islamism the custom of selling whole families for minor crimes done by a single individual was a custom. In the centralized Oromo states of Jibe valleys and Didisa, agriculture and industry sector was done mainly by slave labor. The Jibe states includes Gemma, Gudru, Limu Anaria and Jera. Adjacent to western Oromo states exists the Omotic Kingdom of Kaffa as well as other southern states in the Gojib and Omo river basins where slaves were the main agrarian producers. In Jibe states one third of the general population was composed of slaves while slaves were between half and two thirds of the general population in kingdoms of Jima, Kaffa, Walamo, Jera, Hanhero and Kucha. Even Kaffa reduced the number of slaves by mid-19th century fearing its large bonded population. Slave labor in the agriculture sector in southwest Ethiopia means that slaves constituted higher proportion of the general population when compared to the northern Ethiopia where agrarian producers are mainly free gabbers. Gabbers owns their own land as wrist and their legal obligation is to pay one-fifth of their produce as land tax and azret, another one-tenth, with a total of one-third of total production paid as tax to be shared between the gult holder and the state. In addition to these taxes, peasants of North Ethiopia have informal obligations where they will be forced to undertake corvée forced labor such as farming, grinding corn, and building houses and fences that claimed up to one-third of their time. This same Gaber system was applied to South Ethiopia after the expansion of Shiwan Kingdom while most of the southern ruling classes were made balabates gult holders until Emperor Haile Selassie abolished fiefdom Gultegna, the central institution of feudalism, in the South and North Ethiopia by 1966 after growing domestic pressure for land reform. In 1869, Manelik became king of Shiwa. He thereafter set out to conquer Oromia, completely annexing the territory by 1900. The Oromo inhabitants were subsequently severely repressed by Manelik's troops, with the majority reduced to tenancy and paying heavy tributes for the use of land. Thousands were killed, and large numbers were also sold into slavery. Manelik II and Queen Taitu personally owned 70,000 slaves. Abba Jafar II also is said to have more than 10,000 slaves and allowed his armies to enslave the captives during a battle with all his neighboring clans. This practice was common between various tribes and clans of Ethiopia for thousands of years. By the second half of the 19th century, Ethiopia provided an ever increasing number of slaves for the slave trade. As the geographical focus of the trade had shifted from the Atlantic Basin to Ethiopia, the Nile Basin, and Southeast Africa down to Mozambique. According to Donald, indeed a large part of the increased slave trade in the first half of the 19th century consisted of captives being sold by other neighboring clans and tribes in the south and in Oromo areas. The 19th century witnessed an unprecedented growth in slavery in the country, especially in southern Oromo towns, which expanded as the influx of slaves grew. In the Christian highlands, especially in the province of Shoa, the number of slaves was quite large by the mid century. However, despite the war raids, the Oromo were not considered by the Highlander groups as being racially Baria, owing to their common Afro-Asiatic ancestry. <inaudible> <inaudible> Arab slave trade The Indian Ocean slave trade was multi-directional and changed over time. 
To meet the demand for menial labor, slaves sold to Muslim slave traders by local slave raiders, Ethiopian chiefs and kings from the interior, were sold over the centuries to customers in Egypt, the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf, India, the Far East, the Indian Ocean Islands, Somalia and Ethiopia. During the second half of the 19th century and early 20th century, slaves shipped from Ethiopia had a high demand in the markets of the Arabian Peninsula and elsewhere in the Middle East. They were mostly domestic servants, though some served as agricultural laborers, or as water carriers, herdsmen, seamen, camel drivers, porters, washerwomen, masons, shop assistants and cooks. The most fortunate of the men worked as the officials or bodyguards of the ruler and emirs, or as business managers for rich merchants. They enjoyed significant personal freedom and occasionally held slaves of their own. Besides Javanese and Chinese girls brought in from the Far East, young Ethiopian females were among the most valued concubines. The most beautiful ones often enjoyed a wealthy lifestyle, and became mistresses of the elite or even mothers to rulers. The principal sources of these slaves, all of whom passed through Matama, Masawa and Tadjora on the Red Sea, were the southwestern parts of Ethiopia. In the Oromo and Sadama country, the most important outlet for Ethiopian slaves was undoubtedly Masawa. Trade routes from Gondar, located in the Ethiopian highlands led to Masawa via ADWA. Slave drivers from Gondar took 100 to 200 slaves in a single trip to Masawa, the majority of whom were female. A small number of eunuchs were also acquired by the slave traders in the southern parts of Ethiopia. Mainly consisting of young children, they led the most privileged lives and commanded the highest prices in the Islamic global markets because of their rarity. They served in the harems of the affluent or guarded holy sites. Some of the young boys had become eunuchs due to the battle traditions that were at the time endemic to Arsi and Barena of southern Ethiopia. However, the majority came from the Badi Folia Principality in the Jima region, situated to the southeast of Enaria. The local Oromo rulers were so disturbed by the custom that they drove out of their kingdoms all who practiced it. Italian invasion Under the pretense of abolishing slavery and a border incident, Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935. During Italian rule, the Italians abolished slavery, issuing two laws in October 1935 and in April 1936 by which they allegedly freed 420,000 people. After Italian defeat in Second World War, Emperor Haile Selassie, who returned to power, abandoned his previous ideas about a slow and gradual abolition of slavery in favor of one that mirrored Italy's total and drastic abrogation. <laughs> <laughs> Nature and characteristics Slavery, as practiced within Ethiopia, differed depending on the class of slaves in question. The Tykyor, literally, black, Shankala slaves in general sold for cheap. They were also mainly assigned hard work in the house and field. On the other hand, the Qay, literally, red, Oromo and Sadama slaves had a much higher value and were carefully sorted according to occupation and age. Very young children up to the age of 10 were referred to as mammal. Their price was slightly lower than that of 10 to 16 year old boys. Known as Gerb, the latter young males were destined for training as personal servants. Men in their twenties were called Kadama. Since they were deemed beyond the age of training, they sold for a slightly lower price than the Gerb. A male's value thus decreased with age. The most esteemed and desired females were girls in their teens, who were called Wosif. The most attractive among them were destined to become wives and concubines. Older women were appraised in accordance with their ability to perform household chores as well as their strength. <inaudible> Abolition Initial efforts to abolish slavery in Ethiopia go as far back as the early 1850s, when Emperor Tedros II outlawed the slave trade in his domain, albeit without much effect. Only the presence of the British in the Red Sea resulted in any real pressure on the trade. Both Emperor Tedros II and Emperor Johannes IV also outlawed slavery but since all tribes were not against slavery and the fact that the country was surrounded on all sides by slave raiders and traders, it was not possible to entirely suppress this practice even by the 20th century. 
By the mid 1890s, Manelik was actively suppressing the trade, destroying notorious slave market towns, and punishing slavers with amputation. According to Chris Prouty, Manelik prohibited slavery while it was beyond his capacity to change the mind of his people regarding this age old practice, that was widely prevalent throughout the country. To gain international recognition for his nation, Haile Selassie formally applied to join the League of Nations in 1919. Ethiopia's admission was initially rejected due to concerns about its slave holding, slave trade and arms trade. Italy and Great Britain led the opposition, implying that independent Ethiopia was not yet civilized enough to join an international organization of free nations. It was eventually admitted in 1923, after signing the Convention of Saint-Germain to suppress slavery. The League later appointed the Temporary Slavery Commission in 1924 to inquire into slavery worldwide. Despite the apparent measures to the contrary, slavery continued to be legal in Ethiopia even with its signing of the Slavery Convention of 1926. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Legacy. Although slavery was abolished in the 1940s, the effects of Ethiopia's long-standing peculiar institution lingered. As a result, former president of Ethiopia Mengistu Haile Mariam was virtually absent from the country's controlled press in the first few weeks of his seizure of power. He also consciously avoided making public appearances, here too on the belief that his appearance would not sit well with the country's deposed political elite, particularly the Amhara. By contrast, Mengistu's rise to prominence was hailed by the southern Shankela groups as a personal victory, with one of their own having made good. Racial discrimination against the Baria or Shankela communities in Ethiopia still exists, affecting access to political and social opportunities and resources. Some slaves of Ethiopia or their descendants have also hold the highest positions. Abraha, the 6th century South Arabian ruler who led an army of 70,000, whom was appointed by the Aksumites, was a slave of a Byzantine merchant in the Ethiopian port of Adullus. Habte Georgis Dinajde and Balka Abenefso were originally slaves taken as prisoners of war at Manelik's court who ended up becoming so powerful, especially Habte Georgis, became war minister and first prime minister of the empire who later became king maker of Ethiopia after Manelik's death. Ajegayu Lema Adeyamo, mother of Emperor Manelik who actually founded modern Ethiopia, is said to be a slave. Mengistu Haile Mariam, who declared a republic and ruled Ethiopia with socialism ideology, is also said to be the son of a former slave. 